Hey guys, Tucker here, co-host of the Portland Real Estate Podcast. Before we get into this week's show, I wanted to let you know that we're currently looking for more projects. So for any of you guys that listen to the show that may be an agent or otherwise that have a property that you're looking to sell, we'd love to hear from you. Obviously, we're looking to purchase properties that are maybe not best suited for the retail market or maybe they need to be redeveloped. So we do renovations and we do new construction so we could buy an existing home that maybe it smells like cigarette smoke, maybe it hasn't been updated in decades, maybe it's got some fun functional issues, some problems like that, or maybe it's just in an area that is best suited to take the house down, partition the lot, maybe build a couple new homes, or just build one new home in its place, and anything in between. So if you guys out there in Listener Land have anything that would be best suited selling to a development company like ours, we'd love to hear from you. You can go to our website, which is ttmdevelopmentcompany.com, and when you go there, there's a Contact Us tab. Click on that, and you can send us a message, and we'll get back to you shortly thereafter. We'd love to hear from any of you guys out there that have a property like this, and hopefully we can do a deal together. This is the Portland Real Estate Podcast, your number one place for anything you need to know about the Portland real estate market, along with in-depth interviews from our local real estate industry experts. Now, without further ado, here are our hosts, Tucker Merrihue from TTM Development Company and Steve Nassar from Premier Property Group. All right, everybody out there in listener land, welcome back. This is episode 84 of the Portland Real Estate Podcast. We're back again. We're being a little more consistent, so I'm going to give us a uh, virtual pat on our own backs here. We're uh, trying to get uh, some more episodes out for you guys while juggling running businesses of our own at the same time. And this week, not only did we make some time to join you, but we've got our good friend, Mr. Joe Futsolo, back on the show. So uh, we got a Best of Masters episode. So without further ado, welcome, guys. Hey, guys. What's happening? Welcome back, Joe. Good to have you on again. It's been a little while and we're excited for some great topics. We like to build them up and I think we've allowed enough time so that we've got some fresh topics to go over. We're going to also do a very timely review of the coming soon. There's a saying in sports, that's why they play the game, right? You can sit and you can look at stats and you can talk about it and you can spitball it and you can predict all you want, but until it actually happens for a month or two, the coming soon or a sports game haven't happened. You just don't know what's going to be like and feel like. So we're going to kind of go over some experiences on that. So kicking it off this morning, guys, we're going to start with a post that actually showed up twice. And as Joe can attest to, sometimes this happens, sometimes close together. That In looking at the dates, these were about a month and a half apart. One was Brian Belair's on May 4th. The other was Lisa Mehloff on June 21st. Both of them are about feedback, showing feedback, a pretty hot topic as of late, being that there was two posts. And sometimes when you have two posts like this, Joe, you know, you'll have one that's you got 40, 50 comments. And then the other is like five comments and four of the five comments are like, hey, we just talked about this. But I, it was interesting. That was not the case this time. Both of them had about 30 comments. So I took that as like, you know, it is something that is on the minds of a lot of people. And regardless of whether it was just discussed or not, there was there was still some steam left in the conversation. Brian Belairs on May 4th said, is anyone else getting poor response to email requests for showing feedback? Any suggestions? Why don't buyers agents respond to requests? Lisa said, hi, all. I'm curious if any of you are having success with getting feedback from agents after they show listings the past few weeks. I've had zero agents respond. I find this statistic very unprofessional. I know we're all busy. I've tried calling, texting, and email. Are you getting results? If not, what is the best method of delivery? Joe, why don't you tell us what your thoughts are on this? Okay, so as these both appear like they're new topics, (laughs) these have been covered before, probably a year ago, probably a year before that. Masters has been around for, for about six years. So what I know about this topic is the preferred method of a request for getting feedback is email because we're all busy. We're on the phone, we're driving, and a lot of people really don't want to be called on their mobile phone or they don't want to text the response. So email is usually the the preference of everybody that was polled in masters. They don't like the auto showing feedback website that shoots them something and gives them like way too many questions to fill out. They just want to, Hey, you showed my house. What'd you think? Give me something truthful and useful. And that seems to be the best. 
Now, the biggest preface of this, and this is like Joe's opinion and not the opinion of the group necessarily, but there's a yin and a yang to this thing. If you're a listing agent and you don't put in, you know, room sizes or measurements, it's a incomplete listing. You never answer your phone. Then you get butt hurt because you want feedback that isn't coming in. I think people love to work with people who they would love to work with themselves. So if you're a listing agent, you answer your phone, you tell them maybe some extra stuff that they can't read in the listing, good information as to where the sellers are planning on moving to and when and how much time they need for rent back and what's included and what's excluded. There's a lot of great stuff there. And then when that time comes that you ask for feedback, I think you'll get it. But at least a few years ago, the preferred method was email. And what's nice about email is you can then maybe edit it a little and fire it directly to your sellers. And that's great for, you know, whatever you tell them the price is, if they want to push the envelope. Now it's the same message, but it's not you. It's like other people saying, yeah, we think it's a little on the high side. It smells like a cat lives there, you know, whatever it is. So I think emailing and starting off by answering your phone as a listing agent, and that's the first step. No matter what, there's going to be people out there that just will not get back to you. So acknowledge that as well. Hey, me and Joe went and looked at a house that smelled a little bit like a cat once. Uh, I gave him some feedback on that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think it was a mountain lion. (laughs) Wow. So these threads kind of covered it all. I mean, it started with the reasons why it's important. And I have to agree, getting feedback to your sellers is incredibly, incredibly important. First of all, it makes you the messenger. You're no longer the just the bad guy that's like, hey, you're overpriced or hey, your house smells like pee or, you know, that busy road is a bigger issue than you think. It allows you to just be the neutral party that's just grabbing that and saying, hey, here's the reason they weren't interested. So it is really, really key. In fact, on on my team, we do a weekly report for every one of our listings that's active where we take the week's feedback. We put it on a a nice looking PDF that we email out once a week, along with some other statistics on what's going on and view counts, et cetera. It's a great way to pacify sellers when their house isn't selling, which is a huge part of our job. So getting that feedback is key. I agree with you, Joe. I've defended in years past it. I felt a little exonerated. I'll I'll say it that way. I I felt a little exonerated because in years past, agents I felt were like, well, why aren't you just using the automated feedback? Why do you pay your people hourly to to manually do this process? And and I would always say because you actually get it and it works. And there was a lot of sentiment along those lines. I agree. The automated ones are just too easy to ignore, partly because I think they ask too many questions, also partly because there's not a human there. So they don't feel the guilt of ignoring a human. So we do it manually on my team. And I, I saw a lot of similar comments about that being the best way to do it. What we have found personally to be the best, first of all, is a combination of methods And second of all, persistence is key. If you do any one method, you're not likely to to get results. If you do a combination in a repetitive fashion, I think we get 80, 90% response rate. And it's because we are the squeaky wheel. We don't give up. We start, I think, with an email. By the way, also mentioned here and also agree is a picture is key. Sometimes these agents are showing 10 houses in a day and just giving them the address or giving them your name or being vague, they're not going to remember which house it was. So having in your email, making it easy, don't make them have to take your address, throw it in an RMLS, see the picture there, and then try to return the response. They're not going to do that. However you engage them, usually email again is, is a great way to do this. You need to have a picture of the property in there so it jogs their memory and they remember quickly and then they can say, yeah, that one was a little bit like this. There was a couple mentions of, you know, Asking for feedback immediately, I don't like that for two reasons. One, it looks a little desperate. I've seen scenarios where we leave a house and like within 30 minutes, the agent's asking us what we thought. Two, sometimes you don't know. If you're showing 10 houses that day and that's number three, you might think they like it or you might think they don't like it and you're not going to know until after the day is over and you've compared the rest of them how it's going to measure up to the others. So normally we'll send out an email with the picture 
if we don't hear back within, say, 24 hours, we're sending a text and the email again. And the text references, I just emailed you again. There's a picture in the email. Please reply with just a few, you know, and don't ask a million questions. Just say, is there further interest? If not, why? Perhaps ask about the price. I think that can be healthy to unearth that. And then on, on day two, I guess it would be 48 hours after the first attempt, we're on the phone calling them. I think we give up after that third one, even though it depends. It depends on the seller in that situation. If it's a listing that's quiet and we're not having a lot of showings and we really want that feedback, we might keep stalking them until we get it. Other times, if it's a listing that's you know getting a lot of showings, we might move on. So that's a little bit of a case by case. But it is incredibly important. That's kind of the technique we use. We do get a lot of responses. I, like I said, I think we get 80, 90% response rate. And when we don't get a response, we do let the seller know that. We don't just go MIA on that showing. We say, hey, Mr. Seller or Mrs. Seller, we did have a showing on Tuesday. We've tried. We've reached out multiple times. They will not get back to us. Sorry for their lack of communication, but we'll keep trying on the next ones. And then... Uh, there was one other thing I was going to say on this. You know, it's an interesting topic. I don't really press Chris here in our office too hard to get feedback, to be honest with you, mainly because I'm in a different position than most homeowners, right? And, and you guys are playing kind of the, the middleman with the homeowner in the sense that you walk through a house, you know what the challenges are. Sometimes they agree with you. Sometimes they don't agree. You know, everybody thinks their house is the greatest house. A lot of times, some people are realistic. It just depends on who your client is. And so I think having that feedback kind of helps substantiate the message you're trying to get across to them, maybe from the beginning, but they're just not ready to hear it. So that, that definitely helps with that for us. You know, every project that we do, I try and be as much of a realist as I can in terms of like, what would the feedback be, right? Like, are we pushing the envelope on price? Okay, that's going to be an obvious reason why maybe it had a number of showings and, and nobody wrote an offer yet. Or is it next to a busier road? Or does it have a funkier floor plan? Or does it have a weird bedroom setup? Or, you know, is it missing a master suite? You know, or is there some Uncle Eddie that lives next door that just they can't get around, you know, uh, forgetting about? So there's there's things that I try and pay attention to. So like when we price something, usually it becomes just a price thing that I it, it it's just a matter of where does that house trade on the market, right? That's really what it comes down to. And so we'll call occasionally just to kind of, you know, say, hey, what'd you think? But at the end of the day, they're not telling me anything I don't know. And so for me, I'm kind of in a little bit different position. We just, for us, it's just a matter of, okay, at what price does the market absorb the inventory? And, you know, most of the time I'm right. Sometimes I'm a little bit off, but that's really all that we're going for. So for me, it's not such a big deal, but for you guys and dealing with homeowners, it's a lot more important because, you know, if, if they are on a busier road or maybe they're that corner lot that like abuts a super busy road, right? But their driveway is off on the side road and they think that it's not a big deal because they're not on the busy road. But really, there's probably at least a 5% reduction off of normal retail that's going to hit that house that they just think isn't the case because they're comping something five houses down that quiet street, right? As a reason why their house should sell. And so then you get the feedback and you say, well, road noise is kind of an issue, which basically means price is an issue. So it, it helps substantiate your guys's, you know, uh, opinion on it that maybe they were willing or not willing to hear initially. So for us, we call uh, occasionally. And if we get people, we get people, but I would say more than not, we don't get anybody that, you know, has anything to say, whether it be call or email. Yeah, I remembered what I was going to say. There was a scenario recently. I showed a house, and I don't show a ton of houses, but I was out there one day, and I got an email, I think an hour or two afterwards, requesting feedback. I had the best of intentions with my firm belief how important it is. I fully intended to get to it later that day. And in all honesty, they just never followed up again, and they did not get feedback from me. So I want to reiterate, persistence is key. If you're just doing one thing, don't be surprised if you're having a, a poor response rate. And it's not because people are unprofessional necessarily or that they don't respect the feedback process. Had that person texted me again or even emailed again, I would have been like, oh yeah, they're on it and I, that, I do need to do that. Hey, and I would have probably jumped right on it, but I didn't. So it does happen in those scenarios. So good stuff. Hey, we were also going to talk about Redfin reviews in this segment. 
There has been a post recently on here. I think I think you mentioned it was Quinn Irvine Tucker. Which um, I, before you dive into it, I will say I looked it up while we were talking, and the house is now uh, it, it's been pending, so it, it did sell, so it didn't totally derail everything. But I know he was rather irritated, and I would be as well, because this is like a a forced feedback type situation. We'll call it right. Yeah, yeah, and I had it happen to me recently as well, and I'll I'll give my quick story too. So here's here's basically in a nutshell what's going on. Redfin, in their desire to be innovative, which I applaud, and also the understanding that consumers like reviews. I think we can all agree that the market for all markets, not real estate, just you know anything online, people like to to peruse reviews and see what people are saying. So Redfin kind of combined those two things and came up with this idea where we are going to allow our showing agents when they show a property to go back to our site and and put a review on it. My guess is, and this is a guess, because I don't think I see too many really snarky ones, but my guess is they've probably told their people, keep it tame, don't get crazy. We, you know, we need, we need sellers, we need consumers, we don't want to piss off the market. But every once in a while, you do see something that's either inaccurate or, or you know, isn't as favorable as you would hope. I had one recently where all of a sudden, out of the blue, my seller, who was very in tune to their listing and was all over, you know, the internet checking it out, reached out to us. And that's the thing. that And that's what's frustrating is they, they expect us to be the fixer of this. Reached out to us and said, hey, they're saying there's four bedrooms downstairs when there's really three. So in, in our situation, it, it did correct itself. We reached out to the Redfin agent and and we actually sent them the, the 3D tour and said, hey, check out the downstairs here. I think you might've been, I think you were mistaken. You were mistaken. We said it nicely, by the way, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, could you uh, fix your review to be factual with what's actually going on with the property? Go ahead, Tucker. You, if you pulled up Quinn's, or did you pull? If you recall his scenario, what was it they said about his? Do you? Remember? Yeah. So his, I'll just paraphrase. I don't have it pulled up, but basically, um, you know what he 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 had a project that he had listed that was essentially entry level housing, right? So it was um, a little farther out in, um, let's see here, uh, northeast, right? So we're talking entry level housing, which it's now a turnkey entry level house, which means everything's been renovated, or you know, new services much far superior to, you know, quote unquote, used uh, and lived in entry level housing. And so I believe the Redfin agent hopped on there and basically said, the bedrooms are really small. It sucks, you know, kind of a snarky like Mm -hmm. uh, thing. And it's like, okay, I get what they're saying. Maybe the bedrooms were small, but you got to keep it in context to what the type of housing is you're looking at. If you're looking at sub $300,000 turnkey housing in the Portland area, if it's not a cardboard box, it's and it's updated like it's probably a pretty good product for the market realistically now it, you know sub three hundred thousand dollar houses that are turnkey have challenges that's why they're sub three hundred thousand dollars in the portland area and so i guess just stating the obvious for a, a lower price point house seems like kind of a snarky thing to do and i think that was the irritation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I don't i guess i yeah. just see the point right you're you're deep southeast deep northeast and you're looking sub three hundred thousand there's going to be challenges with all of those houses or neighborhoods. That's why they're sub 300,000. So why state the obvious, right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I pulled up Quinn's uh, post here, actually. And w- he did update it. And he said, Danielle graciously took down the feedback. Um, my concern is still went out to all the people who saved it and still read it. But um, So my, my takeaway here, both scenarios that I'm aware of, this one with Quinn and my own, um, if you – if you are nice and you go back to them and, and, you know, you ask nicely and use facts to your point, they oftentimes will work with you. I will say, I think it's to be determined whether this is a, is the trend of the future or if this is, you know, something that will fade away with a lot of pushback, you know, another area, and I'll give you an example. Um, there have been numerous sites, including I think dating sites that have tried to come up with this thing where you review human beings, right? Like, <laughs> hey, I, are we gonna uh, are we gonna go there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and in and, and some sites, I, I mean, there's even been talk about not even dating sites, but like more like, hey, uh, I met Tucker Merrihew at a barbecue. He's such a great guy. Blah 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 blah. And and the idea there is again, people like reviews in general, 
I think the argument I'm trying to make is there are applications that don't necessarily fit. And I think it's quite possible that houses and real estate could very well be one of them. I think time will tell, but I, I think more people dislike this process than like it. And so it'll be interesting to see how the market reacts. Joe, you have anything to add on this? Yeah, just a little. It's uh, kind of popular in our time right now that we review everything, right? That's You have Angie's List, you have Yelp, you have OpenTable, Amazon, Google. You know, you got to take it for what it's worth. There's people out there that have a brand new restaurant and they talk to 100 employees and they say, whoever gives us a five-star review gets dinner for four here for free. So they're kind of buying positive reviews. Then you have people from competing restaurants that are giving them crappy reviews. And, and so you got to take it for what it's worth. I actually appreciate honest feedback. You know, the listing agent kind of skews everything that that house is, they make it sound like that's where the rainbow ends. But all houses aren't the most fabulous house in the world. I mean, if you ask someone, hey, what are the top 10 things about this house? They'll tell you. Well, every house has what are the top 10 worst things about this house? And people even get selective about that. Like our, our prior topic when Brokers are saying, hey, I want feedback on my house. And then someone says, gee, it's on a double yellow line, busy street, and there's no backyard to speak of. And then the listing agent gets pissed off and it's like, well, gosh, tell me something I don't know. It's like, well, that's feedback. You know, you got to take it for what it's worth. It all boils down to price in a yep. low inventory, low interest rate market. If the thing isn't gone and you're not getting showings and 30 days goes by, it's price because it's the only thing we can change. You can't move the location of the house. You can fix the condition to build it up to that overpriced listing that you have. But the easiest thing to do is price it for what it's worth. There you go. There's feedback for every listing in the world. <laughs> so if I don't get back to you, that's what it is. It's price. <laughs> and that's a good point, Joe, because that's kind of how we take. That's why we don't necessarily go for feedback. If we haven't sold our house <clears throat> in a couple of weeks, then, you know, it's probably a little aggressive on price. That's basically the what we take from it. Um, but I will say to your point about the whole uh, asking for reviews thing, I went to Seattle last week to speak at a big real estate event, and we were going to stay in a hotel. And it had like four stars. It was like three and a half stars. So it wasn't like baller hotel, but it wasn't like, you know, the budget in, you know, times five, right? So we show up there, and it was the most ghetto, fabulous place ever. And we, it was the first time I ever was like, Screw it, Dan. We are not staying here. And he was collectively like, yeah, no, not happening. Right. And uh, but they then we were reading all the reviews on the way to the event. And we we're like, who are these people and where did they stay? Because it wasn't this place. Wow. So, anyway, yeah, you, have to, you have to check the grammar on the reviews. And if they shorten words and put in like little acronyms like IDK for I don't know, then it's probably not a truthful review. Yeah. Yeah, you got to look for specificity. That's my my advice. Um, look for specifics. Like when they say it is a great hotel, I had the best experience. That's not specific. When they say, you know, we showed up there, we ha we waited for about five minutes. We we're a little frustrated, but then she came. She handed us, you know, she offered us coffee, and she was the nicest person. And so, you know, you kind of look and you kind of look for the truthfulness. Like some of the, if it's all great. You know, maybe it's not real, but yeah, it's a there's a we could do a whole podcast on understanding reviews and how to do reviews. And importantly, for us agents who also have reviews on, say, Zillow, um, how to, you know, ask our clients to give us reviews, the things to prompt them to to give reviews that are that look legitimate because they are legitimate and that are compelling. Let's move on, guys. The next one is about cleaning homes. Nadine Mosier. Opinions wanted from realtors. My client at closing asks me if the sellers are cleaning the home. I respond, it's in the contrast on, on page eight that seller needs to remove all personal property, trash, and debris. I ask the seller, are they having it professionally cleaned? They said, no, they will clean it up themselves. My client's girlfriend says every house she has ever bought, they had it cleaned. I responded, while that would be nice if all sellers would, they are not required to. I offered to pay for half the cleaning fee. Now they're saying it should be, have been part of the sales agreement and I should have made it sure of it. So in a nutshell, what she's basically saying, and this is true, the cleaning process is subjective in the sales agreement. The term that's used here multiple times throughout is the word broom clean. 
which kind of conveys no junk, you know, no visible filth or dirtiness, yet not necessarily deep cleaned, definitely not necessarily professionally cleaned as, as suggested in the sales contract. So it is a little subjective. I'll talk first on this one since you, you guys went on the last one or Joe went on the last one and I'll let him follow. I don't have this come up a ton, but when it does happen, it is a problem. And usually, you know, a good rule of thumb on our listings, what we say to our sellers, and I think this is where the, a lot of this starts is on the listing agent side, giving good, good advice and giving good recommendations to their sellers. We say, leave the house, you know, it's almost the golden rule, leave the house how you would want to find it yourself. So yes, do a good job, make it clean. You know, it's the home you've loved for many years. Someone else is coming in to take it over from you. You know, make it a good experience for them. And on our end, most of the time that is the case. There have been a couple sellers over the years that I've had, and I'll, you know, that that did not do that. And the buyer's agent reached out to us. And usually in those situations, we try to work it out with them, including maybe, you know, paying for half of a cleaning or something like that. On the buying side, kind of the same idea. Most of the time, it's not a problem, but when it is a problem, we usually do end up stepping up and somehow trying to get involved. You know, there was comments here about, could this be added into the sales contract? I thought that was pretty interesting. I'll be curious to hear what Joe's thoughts are on this, but basically a few people were saying, why could this be a box that you check? You know, will the home be professionally cleaned? Yes or no. I don't think that's a terrible idea. At least it forces the question up front. So yeah, th there was a lot of, there was 75 comments on this. There's a whole lot of other interesting side notes. Joe, what did you think about this one? Well, so in most cases, they're not talking about vacant homes because if it's vacant, there might be some tools there, but usually there's nothing at a vacant home if it's truly vacant. So we're usually talking about an owner occupied home. Now me personally, when I have an owner occupied home, I will always have a rent back if it's only a day or two, because if they say that we take possession on the day of a recording, the seller has to move out in advance. So if they do that and then it doesn't record, they just moved out of their own home. So to have a, a possession after closing puts you kind of in a tenant relationship. And, and that's how you have to look at it. You know, with my rentals, you look at here's a deposit and here's what has to happen. And if I go into it and, and there's stuff all over the place, you're not getting your deposit back. And if there's zero motivation, then they're going to take what's valuable to them and leave everything that they don't want. And your buyers are going to be mad the way it's left. But if you say, hey, look, we want all of this stuff gone and we have this much money you can kind of hold their feet to the fire. You probably have to fight in small claims or mediation for that money, but it's a little bit more motivation that they have a 500 bucks or a thousand bucks tied up. And I, I think that's the way it, you have to go about it. Here's the biggest thing. If there's like coffee stains and, you know, the dog craps behind the couch and the place is a disaster, you kind of have an idea where like the only time the floors get polished is when you have that like please take your shoes off sign at the front door so all the realtors truck through on their in their socks and kind of swiffer the the floor or it would never be clean <laughs> if it's that type of a house then you damn well better have a deposit there's some people that you walk into it and it's like a model home and i don't think you have to worry about those people so much so kind of get a lay of the land, see who you're dealing with. And if that little thing in the back of your mind says, you know, I need a little insurance policy because I think these guys might leave a lot of crap behind, then get yourself a deposit and spell it out, you know, put it in the contract seller to, to give $400 to buyers for, you know, professional cleaning or that they need to have it professionally cleaned and show a receipt or, you know, just get a big deposit, but there are ways around it. 
And I think that's how people have to protect themselves. There was one other interesting comment in here that I, I really appreciated. And I guess, again, if this keeps coming up, which for me, it hasn't come up enough that I'm, it's high on my radar. But, you know, that could always change. If, if next month we have three of these come up, uh, we'll, we could easily change our scripting or our system to acknowledge this. But one, one agent said, I always tell my buyers plan to have the house professionally cleaned right up after possession. And that's not a bad way to go, but you're basically just managing expectations of your clients and kind of just building it in as, hey, you know, you're you're getting a, a new house, start on the right foot by just assuming you're going to have to professionally clean. We we can ask them to do all that they want. We we can hope they do, and maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised, but just plan on it, build it into your budget. It's about 300 bucks. That wasn't a bad approach. That wasn't a bad approach. You got anything to add here, Tucker? Well, I will say I, I've seen this kind of become a big problem one time, not with anything we've sold, but um, actually an uh, agent of yours who is a family member of mine had a uh, listing that um, she sold, and I believe she ended up spending like a Saturday going and just remedying the problem and fixing it herself because her sellers left it a disaster. Maybe not a disaster, but... They left it, uh, quote unquote, not broom clean. And um, the buyer's agent, and the buyers were very irritated about it. So she just went and dealt with it. But I think it comes it comes down to communication and I think expectations. And I think if you're buying a house that's lived in, I think that's a conversation that probably should be part of the sales agreement, honestly, just to clarify this issue and how you leave it. Because I've bought houses. First house I ever bought was from this very strange fella named Franco Ferrua. And uh, it was in Lake Oswego, and he had a dog. And I knew that I was buying it as is, but, like, literally, there was dog hair, like, in the egg compartment of the refrigerator that I was cleaning out, like, that <laughs> next day. And I was like, God damn, this guy didn't do anything to, like, help clean this place out. Like, it was just disgusting. And that was one that I was going to move into, and I ended up not being able to move into it for another few days because I literally had to clean the place from top to bottom because it was disgusting. But... You know, other times that's what we buy as problems. We buy disgusting houses. So we, you know, that in that case, it's take whatever you want, leave whatever you want. We'll nuke the rest, you know, so or or get rid of it, you know, so it's it's a non-issue. And then when we go to sell stuff, we're basically selling a model home. I mean, we're I'm over there or somebody on my team's over there once a week sweeping up the mess that basically agents make as they don't put on the, the footies and they decide to walk through a house because they're too lazy to put them on. That's the only mess that we clean up. So by the time the buyers go there, we do one last little you know vacuum cleanup and they're walking into a model home. So there's no issue there. But I think if I was an agent, I was selling lived in homes. I think it would be a you know part of my process to have that be a conversation. I know it's harder to talk about in a competitive environment and request that, but at least it's a conversation and somebody can figure out who's responsible and how the money shakes out to make sure something's clean or the time because it's it, it it can be irritating and frustrating for a buyer who's just spent a lot of money on a house and they walk into it and they're like, "Well, they didn't even care to, you know, clean the toothpaste off the sink in the bathroom." You know, like that that can be irritating. I can see that. So, I don't know. If I was an agent, I'd probably address it as part of the contract, as part of the purchase process and just yeah. make sure everybody was on the same page. Yeah, and that's why I it, to sum up, I don't think it would be terrible if it was on the contract because if if nothing else, it just triggers the conversation like, "Hey, do you want to ask them to professionally clean? And then they're like, well, you know, it's a, it's a multiple offer situation. I don't want to put them out. No, I'll, we'll deal with it. Well, if you had had that conversation, then there wouldn't be the surprise at the end, which is what this whole post was about. So right. let's move on guys. Good, good topic. Um, this next one is Adam Schwinn. He is a, uh, a coast realtor, um, somewhere on the Oregon coast. Do you know, Joe, where? I don't know exactly. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like he does a, a fair amount of business. So he had a, he's, he's had some challenges um, and he, he went into it and he was, he did not mince words. So here's what he said. He said, yesterday we received a lead via Zillow about the home here at the coast. We are not the listing agents. We contacted the buyer and offered to answer any questions and set up a time to see the home. The buyer said that he only wanted to speak and work with a listing agent. I always like to know how we can improve our business. So I decided to ask why he only wanted the listing agent after some prodding. I found out that the buyer actually has an agent in the Portland area. That agent didn't want to drive out to the coast to show the home, so they instructed their client to contact the listing agent, ask them to show them the home. Then if they liked it, the Portland agent would write it up for them. After hanging up, we called the listing agent and warned them. Turns out they had just spoken with this buyer who had told them they were not working with an agent. 
here's the deal, folks. It's summer. Your clients are going to go on vacation. If they find a home they want to buy and call you about it, please either refer them to a local agent or if you feel you know the market well enough, drive out and show it to them the, the, and uh, contact the listing agent yourself and arrange for a showing to be paid for. I don't mean to be threatening or to intimidate. That's always a good clue that something something exciting is coming along. But <laughs> if you instruct your client to lie to me as the listing agent so you don't have to bother driving to the op to open a house, I will file a complaint against you with the agency, file an ethics complaint with the association. And if you write an offer, you can expect to be in mediation for procuring cause. We're all just trying to make a living here. If you feel you need to cheat, expect the consequences. So he had some pretty strong words there towards the end. Um, and there was a lot of comments and likes on this. Um, Joe, you were one of the, the likes. What was your take on this? Well, uh, anytime you are in sort of a vacation or resort type area, uh, Cannon Beach, Manzanita, uh, Gearhart, or up at Welch's at the mountain, wherever you are, there's a big influx of people renting a little cabin to stay for you know, a three-day weekend or a week. And it's common that people go through and, and want to look at houses. They go through open houses. They call brokers. Um, it all comes down to my mantra, which is treat your business like a business. You need to screen people. And uh, there's nothing you can really do to protect yourself from someone flat out lying to you and saying that they have an agent or they don't have an agent. What's interesting is these people said, we don't have an agent. We don't have an agent. We just want to see it. But then after further prodding, they said, well, we do have an agent and they're in Portland and don't want to drive down. I, I think where they went wrong is they didn't stick with their lie. Either <laughs> stick with it or, or don't do it. But now we have someone that sort of lied and then confessed. And now this broker's pissed off with, with due cause. I think a lot of the people at the coast I've had many listings uh, at the coast and the mountain, and uh, there are people out of area that that don't want to drive down there to unlock one house. There's other ways to get about to go around it. You know, you can call the listing agent, you can refer it to them, you can work together. There's all kinds of stuff. Nobody wants to work for free. Nobody wants to take time away from their family uh, if there's no specific incentive for it. So I think greed kills a lot of realtors out there. They just, my opinion is some pie is better than no pie. And if I have somebody at the coast or the mountain or wherever that I can't go and show it, I will make arrangements and, and see if there's a love connection. If there is, there's going to be something in it for that broker. Um, but if you're on, if you do have buyers, I would make sure that you get buyer broker agreements signed. If you're a listing agent and and people are asking you to disrupt your Saturday afternoon to go show your own listing, I would absolutely screen those people as best possible um, and go from there. But th there's nothing you can do to stop people from flat out lying to you. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, the only thing I would add here, guys, um, and this is my opinion. I know, Joe, you. I think you have a different school of thought on this, but don't work with buyers that are far, far, far away. I just, I just don't see that as being productive for you. I think I see and that's where this happens. I will tell you, I do list. I have. It's not like I target listings far away, but I've, I have listed. I listed a property in Sisters once. This year, I listed one in Eugene. It's a little different with listings. You send your team down there with a bunch of stuff. You take it live. Um, I, I list a, a fair amount in Salem. That's an hour away. Um, we've got a listing in McMinnville right now. But with buyers, there's just there's so many showings. There's so many, and and so many of them don't work out. So I just I just don't see it as being a good productive use of your time to go back and forth and you know zip all the way an hour or two hours away do the showing only to have them go nope no this one didn't work out and you're now back in your car driving those two hours again back or that's one scenario that's probably the, the right way to do it the wrong way to do it is this post right you're trying to figure out how not to have to do that 
and um, and you're being unfair to other people. And um, I guess I guess the the last thing I'll say is if you're going if you are going to represent a buyer two hours away who has not found a house who's shopping actively, get creative and figure out how to find somebody local that you can pay hourly to help you or to ins get get them on board with part of the process. And I think maybe you touched on that, Joe, but to try to go solo on this and either be deceptive or waste your time with the back and forth, I think is just hugely problematic. Anything else there on that one, Tucker? Well, a longtime mentor of mine once told me there's a million ways to make a million bucks. So why pick the hard and ridiculous way? So that seems like the hard and ridiculous way. So and, and like Joe said, uh, although we've had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, blast from the past, the love connection. Remember that show? Uh, yeah. 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 Chuck, yeah. Chuck Willery. Yeah. yeah. And I was even going to mention the hot or not. Remember, that was like the original rating people site. So we're, we're we got all. <laughs> oh, I, I remember that, too. Yeah. 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 So. But I, I mean, there's a million ways to make a million bucks, right? And, and then there's a bunch of different ways to make money in this business and real estate and both as a realtor. Pick your niche, kind of like you said, Steve, and, and don't deviate too far from it because it's all about time allocation too. And so taking a listing somewhere far, far away is much different than taking on a buyer that's at the beginning of a process of looking for a house far, far away. Like, I don't know, that that might just be a train you let leave the station, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, let's go into the coming soon, Joe. You kick that one off. Okay, so uh, we have uh, we're not citing one particular thread because when coming soon was about to come live at uh, on the second of May, was it? I think um, so. There have been thread after thread after thread after thread, and. Here's my thoughts on it. This this is kind of like the movie Titanic. I wanted to be the only one in the world to have never seen the Titanic. But finally, I just got waterboarded with, it's the best movie in the world and all this other stuff. I went and saw the movie Titanic and I'm like, everybody is going nuts over this way too long movie. You got to be kidding me. So I can't believe coming soon is such a big deal. And, and the irony built into coming soon is absolutely blinding. So here's what I see. Uh, what is a reason for coming soon? Well, look at unethical brokers before coming soon came. What do they do? Oh, they put a sign in the yard. They advertise it on Zillow, Trulia. They have open houses for the neighborhood. They pass out flyers. They have a sign. They put out postcards. They're marketing everywhere. This goes on for three weeks, a month. It's coming soon. It never goes live. So so everybody has the information except the realtors. And, and what's happening here? This listing agent is getting other listings in the neighborhood. They're getting buyers for the neighborhood. If it's not this house, some other house. They're listing potential buyers' houses to, to buy a house. And um, there's all this marketing. And so when your buyers call and say, hey, I saw this house on this address. What's the scoop? And we can't get any of the information. Everyone agrees that that is a source of, of contention. This guy is sandbagging this listing. I can't even have, the only guy that has information on this house is this listing agent. And he's really only screening calls and taking uh, calls from buyers and, and people in the neighborhood and not so much brokers. All right. That is the whole reason for the coming soon. But the people who are pissed off about coming soon is like, yeah, but I don't want that to apply to me. It's like, yeah, it's this coming soon sucks because I can't put it on Zillow. I can't advertise anywhere. I can only put a sign and I can only put it in RMLS. Well, this is like the, the, the devil's advocate, you're, you're playing both sides. It's like, no, I don't want you to list a house and advertise everywhere and recruit my buyers and try and get other listings. But when I get a listing, I want to have it, it as coming soon and I want to be able to market it everywhere. So you kind of have to pick people. Do you want other people to do the, the, the first scenario? And is that more important 
than you doing the second scenario. I think I'm one of the only adapters of, first of all, I don't think the whole coming soon is a big deal. If your house is ready for market, put it on the market. Let the whole world know about it. This whole coming soon is, is it's just a window of what, a week, two weeks waiting for a seller to get a pod or a tenant to get out or how about this? Why don't you go live when it's ready? You know, there's an idea, but I don't mind it because I listening to what Kurt said, other markets, people are getting super protective of their listings. It's back in the day. I don't know if you guys remember the old phone book that came out twice a twice a month and it had nine pictures of houses on each page. That's how realtors used to do it. If you've been doing it long enough, it was this MLS book and we wouldn't post any information because, you know, this dates me, but before the internet, um, the buyers had to call the listing agent to get the information. And anytime anyone is a holder of all the information, uh, it, it makes it a little jaded. So, um, I actually think the coming soon is great. If you want to let the realtors know that it's coming, give them the information of what is coming, put a sign there and, uh, march forward. If, if you're, you know, pissed off about not marketing on Zillow and being the holder of all the information, then you're on the other side of the fence, but you cannot also get pissed off when your buyers ask for relevant information and you have none. So uh, that's my take on the whole coming soon thing, but it shouldn't even be an issue. You should go live when it's ready. There are certain scenarios for coming soon. I agree. Um, but holistically, everyone needs a fair shot. <clears throat> Good stuff, Joe. Yeah, <clears throat> we talked about this a little last week on the show. Um, with when Tucker and I, I was, I was, and I even mentioned that I want, I was excited to hear your take on it. And, and you have a pretty, pretty strong opinion. And I, and I, I'm generally in agreement with you. It, the sky has not fallen. This has not roiled our business to be sure. There are a couple things that have changed in my vantage point. Um, <clears throat> we've noticed a little bit lower attendance at our open houses and I'll tell you why. So back in the day, we were going to go live on Friday. We would start marketing it. As soon as those photos came back, we'd throw up a coming soon on Zillow. We'd throw it up on Craigslist. We'd say open this weekend, Saturday. Um, and so what we called that was pent up demand. We were, we, were, we were showing it to people, but they couldn't get into it. So now they're, they're sitting, they're waiting, they're excited. And um, basically it's a grand opening. We open the gate on Saturday to the open house. It's really the first opportunity to see the house. And now you've just, you've got this, swarm of people that come to the open house. It's harder to do that now. And the reason is because you can't do that pre-marketing. So now if you go live Friday, say Friday afternoon, and your first opportunity to see it as the open house, do you really want to do it Saturday? Because you're, the only marketing out there for it is really less than 24 hours. So what we're doing now, and we're still experimenting. I don't have all the answers. I don't think anyone does because it's such a new process. What we're doing now is if we go live Friday, we're going to do the open Sunday. So now there's 48 hours of exposure out on the cyber universe before the open house. But what that does is now you've got some individual showings Saturday that would have otherwise come to the open house under the old regime, under the old scenario. So it affects our open houses a little bit. It affects your sign you to, to play by the rules, which we all want to do. You shouldn't have the sign up unless you're doing a coming soon before it's live. And we want the sign before it's live because we don't want to try to, you know, time it like you're landing jumbo jets simultaneously and have the sign and go live all in the same day. And I'll tell you why we don't want to do that. If if you go active without the coming soon component, then the rules say you can't have the sign in the yard until you're active, okay? So if you're going active on Friday, for example, that means you can't have the sign there until Friday. Well, is the sign guy going to be there at noon or is he going to be there at three? When are we going out with the flyers? It's just rather than doing that, we're doing the coming soon. So we put the sign up Tuesday, Wednesday, right after the photo shoot. And we're going live Friday. So there's a couple days with a sign there. We, of course, have the coming soon um, sign on the sign. But now you just have, there's a little bit of logistics with making sure you're on the MLS as a coming soon. Because if this, if you have the sign go up 
and you're not listed as a coming soon, then you're in violation. In order to do that, you've got to have your photos and you also have to do it within 72 hours of the listing contract. So there's there's a little bit more logistics to it, but those are the those are the small trade-offs for what you said, the bad actors out there that were using their listings. And I don't even know if, to be fair, I don't even know if they were all their listings. I think sometimes they were just using, they were coming up with bait that wasn't even a real listing. Um, I can, I could swear I've seen some examples in, in months past where an agent and there's some, there's some names, um, out there that are very, very, uh, well known for m manipulating this process. I think they were going and getting random houses and marketing them as coming soon. Obviously they had this, the owner's permission. Maybe the owner was their brother or cousin or something, and they would just throw it up as a bait coming soon ridiculously low price on Z Zillow so that they get a lot of phone calls and then somehow just spin those buyers off. Like, oh yeah, you know, that one, uh, we're talking to the seller. He He's actually questioning whether he wants to sell it. His job's changing, but let me tell you what we do have and let me get you going on a search. So it was, it was really disadvantageous to the people that were not scheming that way and not breaking the rules and not, you know, being shysty. Um, that said, I went on Zillow today for the first time in a couple months, I just, I went in <clears throat> and I, I pulled up Portland Metro and I, I went to the filters and I did any price, any bedroom, any house. And I just clicked only coming soons. I will first, my first reaction was there's a lot less. Um, you, if we had done this, you know, six months ago, there'd probably been hundreds of coming soons. I counted here in Portland Metro, there's about 14. Now my next reaction is, hey, holy smokes, there's 14. What are, what are these? And if Kurt Von Muth is is uh, listening, which I, I think he does, I'd encourage you guys to do this as well and then start clicking on these and calling these agents. Some of them might be honest mistakes where they're old coming soons that somehow haven't been wiped clean, but some of them I think could be just breaking the rules. So, And they will get caught. Um, it's pretty easy to find them, um, basically doing what I just did. So, um, there is still some of it out there, but yeah, I'm with you, Joe. The sky hasn't fallen. I think it's good for our business. I think it's good for our industry. It's affected a couple little nuances here and there, but, um, I'm, I, I'll take that trade off. Tucker. I think you guys said everything that needs to be said on coming soon and i haven't even used it yet so i got very little to chime in with but i think those are both very solid opinions on it cool great show guys yeah so i think Perfect. we hit four big topics with uh, a whole lot of info for people to digest so hopefully they uh thoroughly enjoyed it i know it was fun having those conversations it's always it's always fun when we get into some stuff that irritates people, right? Because that's that's where the good stuff is. So uh, if we, we have a lot to choose one. from. Yes, that's right. So it's everything today. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll uh, we're hitting up uh, on our time constraint here today. But before we get out of here, Steve, any parting words or wisdom, or before we go? My favorite parting word of wisdom was a quote from Joe in our show today that I want us to always remember. If you're going to lie, stick to the lie. <laughs> <laughs> I could have gone all kinds of places when he said that, but I didn't. But yes, I agree. Quote of the show. There you, you got go. got a chuckle out of me on that one, Joe. And I and you're a great guy. I know you didn't mean that in any other way, but it was it was funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm for the record, I'm not promoting that everybody <laughs> lies and and sticks with it. <laughs> I, I I took it. I think you're saying if you're going to be a liar, be, at least be a, at least have the balls to be a smart liar or have the brains to be a smart liar. I don't know. Yeah, just yeah. never come clean halfway through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, all right. Well, that uh, that wraps up episode 84. We'll see you guys all in the next one. Thanks again for listening to our show and make sure to tune in next week for another great episode of the Portland Real Estate Podcast.